So, uh, we've got a great panel, which I will now introduce. One on my left is uh, Professor Paul Rogers of Bradford University. Um, he's um, a great expert on global affairs. Uh, he's uh, spoken over the world, he's written around the world, and he's going to help us understand the US place in the world as it, uh, as it moves forward. Uh, on my right is uh, Mona Alahawe. I got it right, yeah. almost. Elder yeah, <laughs> she is making a terrific contribution um, to this festival. She's everywhere, uh, and um, her story is, I think, an Egyptian American journalist mm -hmm. with a rich experience uh, and a, a, a tough experience. Um, uh, Tahir Square mm -hmm. in 2011 must have not been an easy place to be. Uh, and I understand also the New York subway a little while later was a little awkward when uh, you were busy uh, spray painting over an offensive uh, notice. Uh, but a serious, a serious contributor to understanding the world, in particular Middle East affairs and everything around women's issues in the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on my right is Said Khan, uh, who uh, is from the, the uh, Wayne State University um, in Detroit. Uh, where he teaches uh, Middle East studies and uh, a wide range of courses on everything. And the exciting news is he was spent the first eight years of his life in the UK, so he's got the cricket scores. If you need the cricket scores, I <laughs> can help you. I thought we might just kick off straight away with a discussion rather than sort of little presentations. Um, and these, our subject is US and the world and the role that the US plays within it and without it across the world. And we can't really start off today, I don't think, with anything other than uh, throwing our thoughts to uh, the Supreme Court uh, yesterday and the decision uh, of Roe v. Wade, which for somebody of my age uh, generation is sort of unimaginable. Uh, the uh, New York Times today ended its leader on this matter uh, with the words, we will be paying the price for this de decision for decades to come. So I wondered if we could start off with that. And Mona, why don't you start? You. Tell us uh, how you, what, what it tells us about America. Mm -hmm. Tell us what's going to happen next, because uh, one of the justices said this was just the start. Yeah. Uh, and tell us how it's going to play out. And then I'll ask Said to follow up, and, and you, Paul, if I may. Over to you. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Mona Altahawi, as you heard. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I begin. Um, this way, I begin all my panels this way. It gives you an idea of who I am and how I speak and, and essentially how profane I am. So I'm preparing you for my profanity. You've been warned. Um, and my, I begin everything with my declaration of faith. Fuck the patriarchy. As I said, I'm a very profane woman and proudly so. Um, I had no idea, of course, when I heard that I was going to be on this panel that it was going to come at such a time. We have known for a really long time that the Supreme Court was going to do this because right-wing conservatives in the United States have been working for this moment for at least 50 years. So while it was not a surprise, and it was leaked in April that this would be the decision, while it was not a surprise, I have to confess that I was both enraged and on the verge of tears yesterday. And I say this not just as an American citizen, but I say this as a woman who has had two abortions, one illegal in Egypt in 1996, and the only reason I survived it is because I was able to afford a safe, albeit illegal abortion. And my second abortion was a legal abortion in the United States in 2000. Very soon now to be illegal in many states because of what happened yesterday. I feel that my abortions and America's story with abortion is like a before and after going in reverse. So this is both very personal for me and because of, of the nature of my work very to do with my professional life as well. I think what happened yesterday, as I said, was not a surprise, is a fucking disaster. And I do not say this lightly. I'm glad you read that line from the New York Times. It is, it's difficult to exaggerate what this is going to do. And not just to the United States, but to the entire world. I also speak to you today as a woman of Muslim descent who has lived in the United States since the year 2000 and who has seen the very people who have pushed for what happened yesterday, point to my people and say, oh, political Islam, political Islam. And what we saw happen yesterday is the result of political Christianity. What we call in Egypt the Muslim Brotherhood, 
that is a, a global political Islamic organization, could never have imagined the amount of real world power that what I call the Christian Brotherhood in the United States have managed to achieve. They managed to, they elected a president, Donald Trump, who placed the, the three Supreme Court justices that they needed to, to create this moment, to have their majority. And this Christian Brotherhood has now created a theocracy. We, we must now, it is incumbent upon us to call the United States today a theocracy. This is a theocracy, white Christian theocracy. And it is also incumbent upon us to describe it as a white supremacist Christian theocracy, because this is a direct result of white evangelical Christians who are white supremacists who have been working for this moment, as I said, for 50 years. And it is not going to stop in the United States. And it is not going to stop with abortion, because as Clarence Thomas, who wrote the decision yesterday, said, they're coming next for contraception, they're coming next for privacy in the bedroom, who you fuck and when you fuck, and they're coming next for marriage equality. This is a fucking disaster. You already have this in Poland, and you cannot be complacent. I was speaking in Amsterdam at the invitation of the city of Amsterdam and a feminist organization just 10 days ago, and I said to them, I come to you with a warning from your future. I am here with a warning from your future. This is coming for you. Do not be complacent. Now, a lot, of, a lot of Americans, white supremacy in the United States would shut American women up by saying, be grateful you don't live in Saudi Arabia or Iran. And, they, and by, by constantly distracting them with over there, they created over here in the United States exactly what is happening in Saudi Arabia and Iran, but even more powerful now, because this is the most powerful and the wealthiest country in the world. In the same way, you here in Europe point to the Americans and you say, ha, look at these backward Americans with their guns and their Christianity. It is coming for you. Do not be complacent. You already have Europe here. You already have Boris Johnson here. You're losing rights here. It is coming for you. And I sound like a hysterical woman. This is, this is usually what feminists are called. I am warning you. This is not a Cassandra kind of scenario. Actually, it is. No one believed her and she was right. I am warning you to not be complacent because what the United States has done now is going to embolden theocrats, fascists, and authoritarians everywhere. I'll have much more to say when I drink my coffee, but I think I've brought us off to a good start. What she's going to be like when she's got a bit of caffeine inside her. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I just want to know, is this decaf? Because <laughs> um, yeah, we've got another hour left. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, like, uh, I, like Mona, was uh, dreading the inevitable. And for me, it wasn't really a matter of whether Roe versus Wade was going to be overturned, but in the manner that it would be, and also what were going to be the consequences, because Roe being overturned was not a floor. And we don't know where the bottom is on this one. Uh, it is right now in a free fall, which is creating a, a heightened sense of anxiety. And part of it, if you'll indulge me to talk about constitutional law, the very architecture of Roe v. Wade had a precedent in a case in 1965 called Griswold versus Connecticut. Might be hard for you to believe, but in that year, it was illegal for married couples to purchase contraception in the state of Connecticut. Uh, that law was then repealed by the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court, and in another uh, sister case of uh, Eisenstadt v. Baird, that extended to non-married couples to be able to purchase uh, contraception. But the whole notion of this was based on what was called the penumbra of the Constitution, an implied uh, uh, protection of privacy. The word privacy doesn't actually exist in the Constitution, but it is considered to exist as emanations of existing protections that you have within it. I mean, it's kind of ironic because the very people who want to scupper the right of privacy uh, will invoke the right of privacy to bear arms, for example. So what we have then is a real danger that if we go further back, as is being intended, the very notion of a human being in the United States having a fundamental right to privacy is now in question. And so whether that is going to be invoked for the population en masse or whether that is going to be uh, targeting certain communities remains to be seen. Now, it's interesting because there are three groups that are starting to push back on uh, this with a filing of lawsuits of cases. 
ironically, on religious grounds. So you have a, a Jewish synagogue or a Jewish community uh, center in uh, Florida. You have some Muslim organizations. And you also have the Satanic Temple of America, uh, which uh, is actually not so much a theological group, but does this in uh, a way to uh, expose the hypocrisy of the invocation of religion by the, uh, the Christian right, who are now filing lawsuits to challenge what happened yesterday in the Supreme Court on the grounds that it violates the free exercise of religion of these minority groups. So what it will then do is put the feet to the flame of the Supreme Court justices. That was not aspirational, by the way. That was just a metaphor. <laughs> um, I know that even here in the UK, I, I can't be making threats. Uh, so uh, the very idea then that it's going to uh, really uh, decide once and for all, as Mona said, whether it's a theocracy. And with the current composition of the Supreme Court, there is every likelihood that we're going to see the establishment of a religion, and that being the religion of the, uh, the majority. Well, why is this happening now? Uh, in 20 years, it is uh, estimated that the United States is going to become a majority minority country. That right now it has still a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant uh, uh, critical mass. But over the last two uh, decades, particularly, uh, America is becoming less white, more brown, less Anglo-Saxon, more Latin American, less Protestant, and more Catholic. Uh, the census, which comes out every 10 years, has now affirmed this, that the, uh, the birth rate uh, among non-whites is exceeding that of the white population. And in 2013, the Pew Center for the Study of Religious Life uh, demonstrated that for the first time in American history, uh, the Protestant population is not the majority. It is now Catholics and the nuns, not Catholic nuns, but N-O-N-E-S, uh, non-affiliated, uh, which comprise a total of 60% of uh, the population. This is uh, leading to, and we'll certainly go ahead and unpack this, uh, uh, the moral panics, which are translated into things like the culture war, and explain and inform, as Mona said, uh, the rise of Trump and his ilk. Thank you very much, sir. If I can say firstly that Richard actually used the term expert when he referred to me. Um, I know two good definitions of expert. One is essentially um, a perfectly ordinary person a long way from home. <laughs> the other is X is a has-been and spurt is a drip under pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I, what I think I can help with, I hope, I mean, very much an outsider. I spent a fair bit of time in the United States over a number of years. Um, and I think one thing that struck me some years ago, it wasn't actually in the United States. I was staying in Tehran for a while, about 25 years ago, and staying with a friend who I knew from the university. And we got to talk about the nature of religious intensity in Iran. And I asked him, well, what would he say would be the proportion of Iranians who would go to a place of worship once a week. He said it was probably th maybe 35%, more likely 30%. Now, I think the figure for the United States at present, well, it was over 50%, um, but I think it's now about 45%. But as you were saying, the key thing here is the, is the change. Um, where I'm more familiar with the, uh, what you might call the right-wing Christian element in the United States is, of course, what people often call the Israel lobby, which is a better term to use than the Jewish lobby. Because essentially Christian Zionism, uh, which has been around for a very long time and has been a prominent part of evangelical Christianity in the United States, um, is an element which I think has far greater political power than people realize. Uh, what you were saying uh, about the nature of the, sort of the po politics of what's happened with Roe uh, the, uh, the, uh, v. Wade, Essentially, it's the same kind of attitude. And the curious thing is, you know, there's long been this talk of American exceptionalism going right back to the founding fathers uh, and right back to the Pilgrim Fathers. It's much more complicated than that, but it is essentially, we now have, what, about 110 million people who would describe themselves as evangelical Christians. Is that about right? Or maybe even a little bit more. A very large minority of those would describe themselves as Christian Zionists who believe, obviously, that Israel is part of God's plan. And that goes through to very extreme views in many ways. 
And the point is that it is part of a wider development in the United States. What I question is whether it's basically limited to the United States. Again, the point that you were making. Because if you see across the world in a way which I can't understand, but I think is there, it's part of a much wider tendency over the last 30 to 40 years uh, towards a more a fundamental kind of politics, uh, of, often very populist, mostly from the right, occasionally from the left, but mostly from the right, and exists in a whole range of forms. An awful lot of it is you notice how many countries there are currently where the leadership is looking to make so-and-so great again. Obviously, it was true in the United States under Trump. You see it with Modi in India. You see it with uh, Erdogan in Turkey. You see it with Macron uh, until very recently in, in, uh, in France. And you see it very much as part of the whole Brexit phenomenon in Britain. Sometimes it's hanging on to the past. I mean, Britain and France are the two countries, famously, that have delusions of post-imperial grandeur. We have our P5 memberships, and of course, we have our precious nuclear weapons. It's quite odd that you have this view that, you know, the ability, as Britain has, uh, to kill, a, so what, maybe 20 million people in an hour and a half, which is what a single submarine can do, is a sign of greatness. It seems to me it's more like a rogue state behavior. And essentially, I think, it, what I'm trying to say is it's part of a wider development. I think Roe and Wade is so important in this respect, but it's, it's a sign of something very bigger that's happening. Now, it's not entirely that way. Uh, we've seen some recent elections where you have thriving democracies, where there's been a move against this kind of um, fundamental right-wingism. You see it in Chile, probably importantly surprising, as far as climate change is concerned, you see it in Australia. In Colombia, but essentially, one of the key things as an outsider is what happens, not so much in the midterms, but the next presidential election. Mm -hmm. And if you get a Trump-type figure, then I think the best thing we could do is everybody read, as a matter of course, Margaret Atwood, because if we don't understand what she was saying, I think we're going to be a little bit lost. It's a very tricky time, apparently, a very dangerous time, and this is also a time when we have immense global problems that in some ways are feeding into this uncertainty. But as far as Roe v. Wade is concerned, I would have to agree it's, it's one of the worst developments that I can remember. And don't forget this has implications directly on attitudes to reproductive health, not just in the United States, but across much of the world. Let me just leave it at that for the time being. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, it, it seems almost trivial after these presentations to back off a little and talk about politics, but I'd like to get your views on what's going to happen in the midterms. Will this have an impact? I mean, certainly I've read in the last day um, reports that it's not just women from the Democratic Party who are outraged about this, but they're women in general. Will this have an impact on the midterms, do you think? And if so, what? Uh, would you like to do that, Lynn Said? Yeah. Um, so what I said earlier, you know, I was taking a kind of um, more overall view of what is happening in the US, but I want to specifically focus on, on women now, because this is obviously driven by, you know, patriarchal forces. This is, this is a desire to control our bodies, um, not just women, because as I said, you know, I, I gave you my pronouns, and so we have to be gender expansive in our analysis. This is also to hurt trans people, gender expansive people, to control bodies generally who are not the bodies of white, cisgender, heterosexual, able-bodied men, Christian men. So th this is basically this, a very, very narrow group who's going to survive this unharmed. So we have to recognize just how wide the harm um, that will emanate from Roe v. Wade and its consequences will be. Now, what I, was, what I was seeing in the US and what I've been hearing for the longest time, I'm an anarchist who barely believes in elections to begin with. But in the United States, I'm a registered independent. And the reason that I'm a registered independent is because I think the Democrats are cowardly, spineless shits. I obviously would not re vote Republican, but I say this deliberately because all I see from them is vote, vote, vote. We are beyond voting right now. The Democrats, years ago, could have taken care of this by pushing to end the filibuster, by pushing Mansion and cinema out, by, by doing so many things to offer the federal protection through Congress that has now gone to protect abortion. So the Democrats, all they have to offer now is, is vote, vote, vote. And what happens in the United States, and I'm sure you will touch upon this in greater de detail, Saeed, is that usually when a Democrat is in the White House, the next midterms flips everything and Congress becomes Republican, which will be another fucking disaster now. 
as we then head into the 2024 elections. But looking at this now, as a woman, as a feminist, as someone who is, is queer, and as someone who identifies also as an anarchist, this is like the worst kind of possible perfect storm scenario. Because it, essentially what this is about is controlling desire. This is what abortion bans are about. And then you just have to take it out from there. This is why I quoted Clarence Thomas and what he was saying. This is abortion bans are, yeah, they are about white demographics, absolutely. But also abortion bans are about controlling desire from a very, again, theocratic, conservative way. They are designed to punish us for wanting desire and wanting pleasure outside of a very specific narrow frame of what we're allowed to do with our bodies. So we're seeing the don't say gay bills across the United States. We're seeing the deliberate targeting of trans people, specifically trans children and trans athletes. We're seeing uh, this regression that is incredible to watch, again, in the world's most powerful and wealthiest country. And, and as, as the build up to the midterms come, I, I, I gain very little um, satisfaction, encouragement from this vote, vote, vote thing, because it's too late. It's too late now. We're too late to vote this out. There are so many things that should have been done years and years ago. So what this reminds me of, and you know, I, I keep talking about the Muslim Brotherhood, not because I want to give the theocrats in the US an out. This is specifically an American project. But what I want to remind you of is something that I'm very familiar with, being an Egyptian who spent 10 years as a journalist in Egypt with Reuters news agency covering Egypt for The Guardian and other news outlets. And that is watching how the Muslim Brotherhood, who are now crushed and they suffered a massacre by the fascist regime in Egypt, supported by your government and the US and a bunch of governments. But the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood were able to build up power in a very similar way to what they've been doing in the US. They are disciplined, they turn out to vote. In the smallest elections in Egypt, we would see the Muslim Brotherhood show out to vote in, in, in union elections for like the, the doctor syndicate and, and the engineering syndicate. And they would win because they showed up. They had discipline. And that's what the right wing evangelicals specifically have in the US. They show up, not just to the midterm elections. They show up to school board elections. They show up to local elections. And the Democrats, they just show up, if they do, once every four years. So we are fucked on every level imaginable. I'd like us to take a slightly more Positive line. <laughs> There's very little to be positive no, about. Well, I know. But sorry, why don't you tell us a bit about voting, if you could, among other things? Because one of the things that I notice, and I don't know what you feel about this moment, is that, for example, in San Francisco, in the elections there, uh, the Democrats who should have walked it didn't because they took what was not seen to be a middle ground. They were extreme in defunding the police and all these other matters. Uh, they made their points, but they'll never get elected on that, uh, on that, on those campaigns. So, my anxiety as a kind of old geezer in uh, is in, in Europe is that uh, Trump or his acolytes will get in through by default unless the Democrats come up with some broader agenda that people can support. What, what's going to happen? Well, that's the problem, isn't it? That there's a polarization uh, that is so is is so strong and palpable. Uh, some people use the horseshoe as the example that the, uh, the virulence on the left and the virulence on the right are actually the same, um, uh, simply looking for a different outcome uh, to come with. Uh, I do want to, since you have now sort of cornered me into being optimistic, <laughs> saying something out of my nature, um, not that I'm a pessimist either, um, I'm a recovering goth, um, but uh, the, uh, the, the, the idea that I have to give some kind of begrudging acknowledgement to uh, the conservative movement in the United States, because they did this in plain sight. Uh, as Mona aptly said, that while the Democrats were just simply happy to gain the White House uh, in the 1990s under Clinton, there was an organized campaign to, and this is the last time I took a botany class, recognize that in order for a tree to be seen, you have to plant a seed 30 years earlier on. And the uh, Republicans were very effective in going for the less glamorous positions, school boards, uh, education boards, to the point now where textbooks are being revised to uh, satisfy a particular agenda and a particular narrative, erasing certain very important narratives, erasing entire demographics of people the demonization of critical race theory being one of them, or just simply being used as the ruse uh, in order to then uh, not talk about slavery and some of the, as uh, the late Anthony Bourdain would say, the nasty bits 
in, in, uh, in our history and in, in our background. So I think that the Democrats still haven't really understood that mm -hmm. and seen how to reverse that process because they're still clamoring and they're still just saying, vote, vote, vote. Mm -hmm. They're not saying run, run, run. They're not saying you get out there and you run for those unglamorous uh, offices and start to uh, infiltrate and be some kind of pushback at that time. As far as your question regarding the midterms, I think it's going to be fascinating because on the one hand, yes, there are now people who are, as we speak, taking to the streets and who are voicing their anger and uh, their outrage. Uh, I don't know how long that's going to last. Uh, there is one thing about the American attention span uh, is it's probably about the same uh, lifespan as a housefly. Uh, so I'm not sure that is going to sustain itself until November. Uh, at the same time, although I hope that it will, that this will finally energize people to then mobilize and organize and, uh, and get out the vote, uh, you also have some cannibalism within the Democratic Party uh, of liberals versus progressives, some going too far, as Mona said, some not going far enough, virtue signaling, canceling uh, people out as well. But you also have to take a look at the Republican side of this. I would say that the Dobbs decision probably now has emboldened them. Instead of them sitting back and saying, you know what, we finally won, hallelujah, uh, pun intended on that, uh, that they will now use this as saying, if we could do this, what else can we do? Uh, and that's going to be, I think, very, very dangerous as we, as we move forward into the midterms. And as, as uh, Mona said very aptly, uh, there usually is a flip that the party uh, that is in control of the White House usually loses uh, at least the House, if not the Senate. And as far as the example of uh, San Francisco goes, uh, massive homeless uh, uh, um, uh, issue going on there. There's also a massive crime uh, wave going on there. And people vote for their security first and foremost, even if it's against their other interests. Mm -hmm. And so if they feel that they are being threatened or receiving insecurity when it comes to crime, if they feel as though with the high inflation rate, and I know I'm going to gain no sympathy from anyone in this audience, but Gas is $5 a gallon in the United States, damn it. I mean, it's hurting. Yes, crickets in the room, as I anticipated. Okay. Um, but, but, the, but the fact is that if these are the issues, and the Republicans have, for whatever reason, been very effective in marketing stability, even if it is an instability that they themselves have manufactured in the first place, and it's going to cause a lot of people either to decide, well, this is too complex, I'm staying home, or worse, they're going to go into the voting booth and say, uh, yeah, I'll hold my notes, but I'll vote Republican on that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. gosh. Mm -hmm. Paul, I thought what you said was very interesting about um, around the world are seeing you know, more populist leaders, more Modi's, more Erdogan's, and so on. Is this a kind of irreversible swing? And what, what, how do you take that and other points uh, on this? I don't think it is irreversible. Uh, I hope not. I mean, you know, it, in the sort of work I've been doing for donkey's years, you end up with only three choices. You're either alcoholic, suicidal, or optimistic. <laughs> and essentially, I think there's still a lot of cause for optimism. But I think we are in a, a very uncertain time, even to actually try to work out what might be the results of the, of the midterms. I mean, we, what has happened with Ro, uh, Roe v. Wade is very recent. Uh, and it may be that the intention time is disastrously short. Um, but the other side of the coin is that the other things that are happening, most notably what happens in Ukraine uh, and how the United States develops that and how the different sides play that, uh, that's another factor. And I'm afraid the war almost certainly will still be going on at the time of the midterms unless we're incredibly lucky. So I'm really cautious about trying to predict as an outsider from this. But on your more general point, Richard, I think we are in that position of politicians find it easier to appeal to the basically lowest common denominator than at many other times. We're in an era where it's very easy to play, I hesitate to use the term, almost play to the mob. You know, what are the easy things that people fear? Can you stoke those fears? Uh, and in doing so, can you succeed in getting more political power? And I wouldn't say that this is restricted just to the right. Uh, I think it's world circumstances are developing in a particular way which make it more easy for the populace of any dimension, but I have to say pr most commonly on the right, to actually score. Um, whether that will continue, I think it's 
Very difficult to say. I think we're on to a different subject. I know we may come on to it later. I think the really big issue that's facing us is the extent to which climate breakdown actually starts to happen seriously in the next five to seven years. And the signs are that it will, unless there are very big changes. That's going to cause a huge amount of rethinking. And I look around in many parts of the world, and there's very little interest in this among people over 50, except a fairly small group of what you might call the, progressive, the more progressive oldies. But there are far more people uh, in the younger areas who are hugely concerned with the nature of this kind of future. And we simply don't know at the moment whether that will be opposing not just the lack of action on this, but also these wider issues of the way populism is, is catching. Uh, maybe this is being optimistic, but I think there's a chance of this. But I think what we see, what we see very much, I think, in what happens in relation to this particular development, Roe v. Wade, and how it impacts worldwide, I'd say in the next month is going to be the key. And if it tends to fade away, that will be disastrous. If it doesn't, then it could be just the start of something else which is also happening, a kind of culture, a, a counterculture, which I think is beginning to develop. It's very early days and very difficult to actually sort of tease out. But you suspect we're in such a, an extraordinarily different era now. I mean, we, we've got the three things happening, the sort of three big things happening worldwide, which transcend, transcend almost everything else. Firstly, the nature, the current nature of the world economy is not working. It's not fit for purpose. You're getting wider and wider differentials and more and more people on the margins worldwide. Secondly, inevitably, we now are at and beyond environmental limits to growth. And we're now experiencing that on a near daily basis. Look at what's happened across South Asia in the last few weeks. And it's been a level of heat, which you might get at the hottest time of year, but not in May. Uh, and it's, that, that now isn't happening. But the third thing, which we probably don't have time to touch on, is the tendency to essentially protect yourself, to close the castle gates. There's an extraordinary development yesterday, another major uh, incursion, attempted incursion into Melilla, one of the two uh, Spanish enclaves in Morocco. And essentially, quite a few people were killed in the attempt. And this is two or 3,000 people determined to get through the barriers to find some way of getting to Spain. It's not the first time it's happened. There have been problems over the last two or three years. But essentially, you're seeing that graphically, and it came through with Trump as well, the close the castle gates phenomenon, keep yourself safe. And that, I think, is starting to fray. This is very unhelpful, because you can't really say this is what is going to happen. Uh, and I think we're in extremely uncertain times, but it means that we have to spend far more time in trying to understand what is happening and how they interconnect. Let me leave it at that just for the moment. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. I'd like to add something Please. real quick, because um, you touched upon it earlier, Paul. Um, I want us to also pay attention to something that happened just a few days before Roe v. Wade. You touched on Chile. I want to touch on Colombia. Because yes. I think that where we should also be looking is Central and South America. Because when, you know, when we say America, there are Americas, right? We're talking about the United States. Let's expand that, our vision or our viewpoints and look at the Americas. Because Mexico and Argentina, over the past couple of years, decriminalized abortion and set into place, you know, thanks to a massive feminist movement that wear green handkerchiefs and, and scarves called ni una menos, not one more or not one less, depending on <coughs> how you translate it. It was a feminist movement that was sparked by alarming rates of femicide. And they were instrumental in getting Mexico and Argentina to decriminalize abortion and now become these kind of role models in the Americas generally, and now becoming a role model to the United States. Mexican feminists are now helping women in the United States get access to abortion in the way that a few years ago, women in the United States were helping women in Mexico gain access because abortion for them was illegal. And then Chile had an election a few months ago um, in which the president is the youngest president in history. I think he's 35 years old. And many of his cabinet, I think his cabinet is half women, if not majority women, uh, many of them are queer, many of them are from the student movement, and that, that was incredible. And most recently now, Chile. Which, Colombia. Uh, yeah. uh, sorry, Colombia. So Chile was a leftist president, and now also in Colombia, a leftist president whose vice president is the first black woman to have a senior leadership in Colombia. So we're talking about um, leftists, uh, younger uh, politicians, often queer identifying, coming from student movements, basically giving us some, that optimism that you were talking about, Richard, 
that has to be a role model for the United States in the way that the United States used to insist it be a role model because of its so-called exceptionalism. I really think where our hope and that role model for the entire world now lies is in the Americas, in, is in Central and South America. Thank you. Said. Yes. Um, I think that's, that's a really important point. Um, we still think of as the United States as the role model for the world and the, uh, the nuclear umbrella that protects us all and all the other stuff. Um, is, it, is it sustainable in the current uh, structure of democracy in the United States? How, and <coughs> how will we cope if we can't rely on some kind of, um, I hesitate the word liberal because that's illegal in the United States these days, but you know what I mean, some kind of uh, cohesive uh, outward-looking society rather than the one you describe of so rightly of closing the doors. How, is that going to work? Liberal with, a, liberal with a small L. Okay, yeah, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll go with that. Um, I'm not sure how many people in, in the U.S. really study enough Enlightenment philosophy to understand liberal with a big L. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the, the idea of... Um, I, I think that question has already been answered. I think that America's profile in the world has, has severely been diminished. And if you're asking about emulation and leading the world, I, I think the, at one time people used to see that as the good news because um, uh, people would emulate the ideas of liberal democracy, rule of law, et cetera. And now I think you're finding people want to emulate it for exactly the other reasons, for the fact that the rule of law is being abdicated. Uh, I think that people like Viktor Orban will now say, yeah, I, I, I really want to be American because it validates what he's doing. And the same thing with Erdogan. And, and I'm sure Modi must be uh, certainly very happy as well, because people can say, well, if America is doing it, then why can't we? Mm -hmm. And that is, I think, perhaps the most dangerous thing, apropos to, uh, to what Paul uh, was, was indicating. I, I think that the Trump presidency uh, woke people up to a reality that was happening regarding the United States. Uh, unipolarity was unsustainable, and after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, I think that the U.S. simply thought that it could, to use a John Wayne term, uh, ride into the sunset. Uh, if you remember back in 1992, uh, the political economist Francis Fukuyama uh, wrote a book called The End of History and the Last Man, invoking Hegel. Uh, and his book was then soundly pilloried, and rightly so, for his, uh, his eagerness being far too premature. Uh, because he didn't uh, anticipate the rise of China, uh, and he didn't uh, anticipate the rise of a vengeful Russia, which uh, became quite upset at being marginalized during the 1990s, if you remember the Balkan War. America's unilateralism then circumvented any uh, institutions on a global level which were seen as obstacles or a nuisance, whether that was the United Nations Security Council, where Russia, uh, Russia would have a veto, uh, a permanent veto there, uh, or anywhere else. So the US then went into the areas that it found comfortable where it still wielded power, NATO. I don't know what NATO has to do with Afghanistan. I mean, it's not near the Atlantic, um, although in the minds of some geography students in the US. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, but the uh, ironic, given it's a landlocked country as well, but, but the fact that, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the movie Fatal Attraction, there's that great line by Glenn Close, I, will, I won't be ignored. And I think that a lot of the world was feeling ignored by the US simply gloating and being intoxicated with its own success with the Cold War, which was, of course, rather myopic in taking a look at it. What is happening today in Ukraine has a direct correlation to what was seen then as first the complacency and the hubris by the United States. If you look at the Middle East, for example, there was this hubris by the United States that we're the sole superpower that's involved. That's no longer true. Russia is physically now in the Middle East in a way that is unprecedented, and so is China. And now that Biden is back and trying to rectify the situation of re-engaging uh, America, whether it is at uh, the Kyoto or the Paris Climate Accords or anyone, I think the world has moved on. Some years ago, it was probably 2011, when Obama was well into his second term, I was at a meeting of the British International Studies Association, uh, and one of the people there was expressing a pretty wide view 
among the, the academics, who are mainly of a, a liberal hue, uh, that, Biden was that uh, Obama was turning out to be a real disappointment. You know, here was a progressive president really not changing things. And one of the other academics who was a, from a much more realist perspective, he said, I think the one thing you've got to understand about Obama is he's trying to do something which is almost impossible to do, um, handle a superpower in the early stages of decline. Uh, it's a very subtle point because, you know, another, uh, another anecdote, just a quick one, and then I'll shut up with anecdotes. When I was uh, a student, which is nearly 60 years ago, uh, a friend of mine was from Ghana. And we got to talking in a sort of rather jocular way about the British Empire. And he looked at me and said, you know, we had a saying in, in West Africa, um, do you know why it is that the sun never set on the British Empire? I said, gullibly, no. He said, because God didn't trust the British in the dark. <laughs> now, when you think about that, that is a completely different world view. Uh, but it is, in its own way, a very valid one. And essentially, it struck me just uh, about four or five weeks ago, looking at what was happening on international opinion on the uh, Ukraine war. And when you look around the world, uh, you found that most countries of what you might call the Atlantic group were broadly supportive of what was going on uh, from the NATO and US side. Uh, in fact, pretty generally supportive. When you look at across what I may usually, loosely use the term the global south, it's very different. It wasn't so much that, yes, Russia is right, the West is wrong. It was much more a plague on both your houses. Mm -hmm. And as one, uh, this, uh, uh, you know, one, uh, somebody at work pointed out to me, a guy from, I think, actually Palestinian, yes, it was. Um, he said, the thing that you've got to understand is that, you know, what you've been experiencing over the last few weeks is on 24-7 war as it actually happens. And it's not the sanitized version. Because essentially the Russians were bad, we were good, and it's happening on the doorstep, it's 24-7. He said, we were getting this for year after year in Al Jazeera, the Arabic Al Jazeera, but not the English language Al Jazeera, which is almost self-censoring. And so the idea that you know, what the Russians are doing was appalling, absolutely right, it is appalling, but they took a different view. And the reality is um, that after, after the end of the siege of Fallujah in November 2004, the city of Fallujah was largely reduced to rubble because it's the only way that the, basically the insurgents could be dealt with. And much more recently, when ISIS had been finally expelled from um, Mosul, essentially, if you look at the western part of the city, the old city was actually wrecked. You know, you look at the pattern of the bombing because that was the only way it could be done. And in, any, in many ways, they were similar in intensity, but they were done by us, by the West, uh, to people in the Middle East, and we never recognized that, just as it's been very difficult for people on the right in Britain to even come into terms of the wider dimension of Black Lives Matter when it applies to decolonization. Okay. It's a very difficult time to do it. So this is where, but it is so easy then for the populist politician to fall back and make people feel secure by saying, it's the rest of them against us. Uh, this has taken a little bit off the subject, but in a, in a way, I think this fits in very much with how many people in the United States and many people across the Western world are having real difficulty in understanding all the changes that are happening. And uh, it doesn't make it any easier to try and analyze it, but I think once you get this wider dimension, you're on the right path to recognizing what has happened, and more particularly, to having some chance of predicting what might happen next and what you might do about it. Um, in a very optimistic time, I would say that, you know, there's a very good definition of prophecy, and prophecy is suggesting the possible. Suggesting the possible. And the point about that is this is the time, at an extremely difficult time, where you have to have the people saying, yes, but it can be like this, and this is what could happen, and this is what needs to happen. Uh, it's going to be a lot of hard work to do it, uh, and I think coming back almost to what we talked about earlier on, the reaction to Roe v. Wade and how that develops may be an important marketer of how big the issue is and how much huge effort we're going to have to put into it, I'm afraid. Yeah. Could I, could I respond to that, please? And thank you for that. Um, I'm glad that you raised Obama, because I think that this whole notion of slowing down the process of decline of the United States was something that Obama seemed to understand intuitively. Uh, a far more nuanced uh, uh, thinker than the blunt object that was his predecessor, 
and his successor. Uh, and what you find then is his two hallmark foreign policy achievements were the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, and the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, what people don't really understand because of, I think, the rhetoric being distracted by what would happen with, uh, with Israel and with the Gulf allies, was that the nuclear deal with Iran was at its very core a way to prevent China from penetrating even further into the Middle East. It was this idea that if we can court Iran, bring it on side uh, by normalized relationships with it, it will not then fall into the orbit of China with its burgeoning uh, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, the new Silk Road, if you will. Uh, and of course, America's political profile, especially domestically, wouldn't let this happen. It's like the last line in um, uh, E.M. Forster's A Passage to India, but the horses wouldn't have it. And uh, I think in many ways that, that, that is apt uh, over here as well. And then the TPP was an effort to go ahead and curb uh, the dominance of China economically in the Pacific Rim. And what ends up happening is Donald Trump comes in and takes the United States out of both, which then completely scuppers America's uh, ability to have influence. All of the countries that were part of the TPP joined the RCEP in kind of a new configured thing because, well, they have to live with China. And then you have, of course, China signing a $400 billion over 25-year deal with, with Iran. And Iran now feels completely emboldened to not have to even worry about American sanctions. So the, the, the impact of those, I don't think, has really fully been understood about how it actually served to accelerate the decline of American influence uh, in places where it was really needed. And now when America then joins this so-called quad with Japan and India and Australia as a bulwark against uh, China, well, let's see. Japan is separated by the Sea of Japan, which is about 100 miles. Uh, they're not going to antagonize uh, uh, China. All China has to do is divert its industrial uh, pollution output, and, uh, and Japan is going to be under a cloud of smog. Uh, Australia um, is, is dependent on, uh, on, uh, on China as well economically. And India has proven to be rather unreliable, uh, particularly when it comes to its posture toward Russia uh, during the Ukraine. Uh, and also, uh, given its magnificent military performance uh, against China in 2020 in two relatively um, uh, uh, minor uh, border uh, skirmishes, I don't know how anyone could see it as being a strategic military uh, a reliable ally. So, yes, win one time. for American foreign policy analysis. It's time to turn it over to you yeah. uh, for yeah. questions, comments, criticisms, and discussion. I'm going to, at the end of it, I'm going to ask each panel member to talk for one minute on the subject Paul just brought up, the hard work that has to be done to get us to a better place, and what sort of work that might involve. But for now, please, over to you. Who would like to uh, ask the first question, make the first comment? Thank you. At the beginning of the conversation, side was talking about the uh, changing demographics of the religious constituencies in the US. I was reminded of a book I read a while ago, Cultural Evolution by Ronald Engelhardt. And in that, one of the things the World Value Survey was noting was the extent to which America was rapidly becoming less religious overall. And I've been trying to square that with some of the things that you were saying um, uh, earlier on. I'm, I'm wondering whether the questions in that survey are, in a sense, showing a decoupling of questions about religiosity from actual religious commitment, or what they're saying. Is America really becoming overall a less religiously committed country, despite the power that the uh, religious constituencies have? It, it, it seems to be a contradiction. I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, that the United States is statistically becoming proportionally rather less religious. But at the same time, the religious element is becoming stronger. Yeah. I think this is the extraordinary thing that's happened. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I, I stand to be corrected by the, this, but that, that's the way it's seen. I mean, certainly the intensity of the religious right, uh, the Christian right, uh, is remarkable. One, other, one small thing, though, always remember that when, whenever one is talking about the idea of theocracies, there is only one place in the world, one place in the world, which is an hereditary theocracy. And that, of course, is England. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't say the Vatican. Uh, uh, no, no hereditary succession there. <laughs> um, I, I think your point is absolutely uh, spot on. I, yeah. And I think it is really contingent on how one defines religious. 
Uh, I would suggest that what we have is a metamorphosis of a, of a Kafkaesque nature where it's now religious identity, which is masquerading around as piety or religious observance. Yeah, so we find that the commodification of religion, and again, I, I don't want it to be thought of just simply a Christian problem. You're, you're finding that the commodification of Islam, the commodification of Judaism, the commodification of Hinduism uh, are all rampant whether it is from diaspora communities, immigrant communities, or even from within. Uh, it is a kind of lazy and uh, rather superficial engagement with religion, uh, because everything now has a badge. It's, it, you can be team whatever. And now, as you see, when it comes to football jerseys, uh, half of them are owned by oligarchs. Uh, I think there's something to be said about the parallel with religion as well in America. I think if I can also answer your question like with one sentence, it's what we're seeing, what, what has been happening in the United States is a group of white Christian zealots who have used democracy to cut democracy at its knees. And so they're not the majority because the majority of Americans actually support the right to abortion. Yeah. But they've been able, so this is about power, they've been able to use the democratic system to cut democracy at its knees. Next question. There, in the back there, please. Thank you for fantastic presentations. I thought they were all really, really stimulating and interesting. Um, my question really is, and, and I think Paul alluded to this a little bit, um, I, I'm interested that you haven't really gone to the role of global capital and the financial systems in this discussion, because it just seems to me that one of the reasons why states are intervening more and regulating more in private lives is because they have allowed themselves to be emasculated in the regulation of our financial markets and our financial system. And it's an awful lot easier to focus on the individual uh, than to capture that lost ground. Do you want to have a go at that, Mona? Goodness. <laughs> Capitalism is evil. <laughs> no. Um, you know, it, what you're saying is interesting and, and very important specifically now that, you know, the pandemic is not over. I know everyone in this country acts like it is, but it's not. And it's um, one of the things that we are reading from in, after this, especially the two years of lockdown, is the impact of the pandemic on financial systems, but also on us individually because of the amount of people pushed out of jobs, the amount of people pushed out of various industries, and what that does to people in these various identity groups that we've been talking about. I, I come at this from a feminist angle. Um, as a feminist, I have to focus on, on both your points. Um, the, the impact of the financial systems on us and also the, 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 the effort put into controlling our bodies. Because I want us to imagine right now that what is happening to us, to people who have uteruses in the United States, is we are being told we're essentially walking incubators that are being forced into giving birth to create workers for these financial systems that you're talking about. And, and this, this is as stark as that sound, it sounds like it sounds like some kind of brave new world scenario, but that's effectively what it is. So we have to we have to dismantle the way capitalism has ruined lives around the world. We have to dismantle the way we have to look at the way that these economic systems have been incredibly unjust to so many people. Who are the people who have been impacted the most by the pandemic? Black and brown people, working class people, disabled people, you know, the people who hurt, are hurt the most by these financial systems. But we're also, the very people who are hurt by these financial systems are the ones being pushed out in the face of a continuing pandemic to save the economy. To save the economy for who? So this is a complicated way to answer your question, but it is ultimately a way to reckon with capitalism and to ask who has capitalism been benefiting all of this time, and clearly not the majority of us. We could probably spend uh, the whole of the session talking about the nature of neoliberalism or call it market fundamentalism and its current role. Um, what I would say is that we seem to see a kind of connection here. What, however you analyze the current economic system, um, what hits you is when you look at the changes in the distribution of wealth. Uh, you have that extraordinary detailed report from UBS, you know, the big Swiss bank, uh, just I think about 18 months ago which said that in the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic, the world's billionaires, and there were about 12, was it 2,000 of them at the time, the world's billionaires increased their personal wealth by over 20% in the year when so many people were struggling. There's something, whatever, whatever 
point you're from, you know, if you believe that capitalism is the answer, if you believe it isn't. The point is something is going very seriously wrong. And uh, just the, the autumn before last, um, there were indications of what you call revolts from the margins, um, civil unrest basically due to economic issues developing in a number of countries simultaneously. About eight or ten countries in different parts of the world. It didn't break out into something more general. But I think the risk is that we move into this era of revolts from the margins. Um, and that, in a sense, is something I said, there isn't, we can't go to all these things at this time. And it's the combination of that and the impact of environmental limits. And one thing on that, incidentally, one of the countries that looks like it's going to suffer the most from climate breakdown is actually China. And that's one thing you have to factor in when you're working out how strong China is going to be. If I'm allowed to say just one word on this matter, because I care about it a lot, I think that um, capitalism worked rather well for 50, 60 years after the Second World. Capitalism doesn't have to be the model that the United States has created over the last 20 or 30 years. Capitalism is a terrible system, but it's far better than anybody else in the, anything else that has been tried anywhere else in the world. So we need to, I would argue, we need to think about the nature of our capitalism and how to, uh, to make it fairer, to make it more, to adjust it in a way that is not entirely driven by markets. We have to assume that not everything has a price, but I would just caution, my view would be, that um, a lot of people in the world have been lifted out of poverty over the last 60 years by capitalism, uh, and everything else that anybody's tried has failed. Is that a message from our sponsors? We don't have sponsors here tonight. Uh, oh, I mean, it's a message from me. No, I'm a promoter of capitalism. I spent all my life working for the Financial Times, and um, I think that uh, capitalism has a, has a uh, compared with other models, has a record of success and has created health and prosperity for lots and lots of people. But you don't have to agree with that, because it's... And, the, and the, the thing for me is, is the current model reformable? That's the question. That's the key question. But the last attempt, the last political attempt to, to put forward a reform of the current system of capitalism was actually the three or four, four pages on economic policy in the Labour Party's 2017 general election. It's a very interesting document. But of course, in many ways, there were so many other issues, and I suspect that it wasn't acceptable um, to many of the elites at the time. But the reality is that set in the possibility of reforming the existing system. Um, my only problem with revolutionary change is revolutions have a habit of basically changing the nature of the accents of the elites, rather than anything much more than that. Uh, which is why, by and large, I would want to see radical reform rather than a complete upheaval, because I think more people will suffer from that. Uh, yeah, go on, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, in a sense, as, as Richard was saying, um, that there, there were attempts to do this. I mean, it, you know, go right back to Roosevelt's New Deal. Uh, and that was essentially what this is generally about. But you have had the change after what, several decades after the Second World War, of a very different system coming in. And you have what was the Garn Saint Germain Act in the United States, which actually deregulated large parts of the American backing system. And you had in Britain, obviously, all the processes of the 1980s, which seemed to work quickly, the whole of the Thatcher period, but basically it's turned out to be really, well, something of a, of a dud. But you come back time and time again, how do you change it? And how do you actually do it in a way which doesn't cause even more suffering, at least in the short term and possibly the long term? I don't know. But I suppose at that level, I would tend to be on the reformist side rather than the revolutionary side. Question there, and then one there. We talked a lot about the different countries, right, left, uh, Republican, democracy, and all this kind of thing. Um, I was kind of hoping there might be a, a little bit of a mention somewhere in amongst all this about the World Economic Forum, because um, it kind of seems like they've kind of been implementing policies um, that, you know, have kind of in a way encourages people to kind of not get along with each other. And then of course, we're going on about this kind of climate problem that we've got. Um, also seems that the media kind of encourages people to do and buy things that, you know, doing and buying those things causes more damage, which, you know, seems to be, uh, well, a bit of a major thing really. Um, 
and it, well, I kind of hoping that we might have heard something where they were kind of getting tied up together today. The WF at times has sort of always sort of been trying to wring its hands and work, well, what can we do? Things are getting worse, but it doesn't come up with any sensible answers, I'm afraid. No. I don't think it can in its current format. No. Question here. Uh, I too believe in what Mona was saying earlier on about the, you know, and the spirit of hope. And you related to that as well, Paul, you know, a, a sense that actually we've got to straighten and get our house together and that there are examples of positive, responsible, optimistic yeah. um, uh, ways forward coming out of places. My only concern, actually, in relation to that, and I want to share the optimism, is that I have a memory that America is not usually well disposed towards uh, changing political tides for the positive in South America. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, my, my one, my reason to be optimistic is that America right now doesn't have the ability to do what it used to do, I, I hope and think, in South America that it did in the past, because I think it's so consumed with what's happening inward right now, so busy with what Putin is doing and China, that I don't think it's paying enough attention, thankfully, to what is happening in countries like Chile and Colombia. And may it never pay attention to them, and may it leave them alone so that they can continue to spread what they're doing, all of this incredible stuff that they're doing throughout Central and South America, because we need that to push back against the shit that is happening in the United States these days. So I hope they never get enough attention to harm them in the way they have in the past. Well, their, their, their effort to try to unseat Maduro and to prop up Guaido was an abject failure. The question is, do they concede and move on, or do they double down and try uh, uh, more, more virulently to, to try to get their will. And, and that's always an open question with the US. There are lots more questions, but I think we need to wind it up. I'm sure the panel yes, uh, yes. members will be around for a little while. Could I ask the panel quickly? I mean, you said lots of work to be done to get things right. Tell yeah, us what I, the work is. I don't is. think I would sort of try and develop that anymore. Um, yeah, that definition, I love it. Prophecy is suggesting the possible. If we can have more good ideas coming forward, then the change which has to come in my view, in the next five to 10 years, will start to come easier. And that seems to be a very good way of working, a way of aiming to improve our position. Thank you, Paul. No, no. Um, look, my solution to everything is feminism, because I think what is happening right now is driven by patriarchal authoritarianism. And we've seen that kind of patriarchal authoritarianism really dig in its heels during the past two and a half years of the pandemic. It will continue to do so. All the names of all of these leaders that you've heard from across the world, Erdogan, Modi, um, Bolsonaro, Duterte in the Philippines, all of them are patriarchal authoritarians. And all of them will get worse and emboldened because of what's happening in the United States. The positive examples I've given you from Argentina, Mexico, Chile, and Colombia are very feminist because they, they, they are driven by, and by feminism I don't mean the destruction of men, and I don't mean solely misogyny, because I think what happened in the United States is a result not only of all the things we've talked about, but a result of the failure of US feminism, because US feminism, this is the subject matter of another panel. So the kind of feminism that I'm talking about is a feminism that focuses on the injustices of white supremacy, capitalism, and misogyny, but also homophobia, transphobia, so many isms and phobias. And this is where the hope from countries like Mexico, Argentina, Chile, and Colombia, um, as feminist examples of reasons to be optimistic, can help the United States, but also the rest of the world. So feminism is the, as I said, fuck the patriarchy. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, uh, two things I would say as far as the solution. Number one is I think that there needs to be a recognition by the United States that its uh, shelf life of being an empire are now over. Uh, and the second is, uh, if somebody were to ask me, uh, and I know this is gonna be very, of course, delicate now, uh, what happened yesterday, if there's one Supreme Court decision that I think needs to be overturned, I will say with respect, before overturning Dobbs, overturning Citizens United, which mm -hmm. allowed for the rampant and unlimited amount of money to come into the political and the electoral system. If you take that out, you could actually then also solve the issue of Dobbs and reverse it and restore a lot of the rights that uh, are already uh, being usurped and ones yet to come. 
I think uh, we've had a, a, a great uh, presentation, a great discussion. And I think, to Mona's last point, it's another reason for being confident about Bradford, uh, because uh, the mayor of the West Yorkshire Combined Authority is a woman. I was on a panel with her before I ran over here. The chair of the council is a woman. The chief executive of the council is a woman. The vice chancellor of the university is a woman. So, Mona, stay at Bradford. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.